as Americans vote to choose their representatives in Washington, it's important to ask the question, who do these candidates really represent? Do they have Americans' best interest in mind? Or perhaps those of another nation? What the lobby is all about is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. We try and go through student government and pass bills. I mean, you know, looking back on it now, it's all bull****. It's total crap. So, yes, in general, obviously. But also, it's just, I don't know, it doesn't do anything. I mean, fighting back against it has no practical effect. What has a practical effect is getting Congress to give Israel a military aid. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what happens at the University of X. What matters is what happens here, what matters is what happens in the capitals of the state, the capitals of other countries. Does the war of ideas matter? I don't know. I don't know. I, I know that like getting $38 billion in security aid does all matters, which is what APAC just did. It's what I'm proud of being, I've been a part of for so long. My job was basically to convince students that participating in the war of ideas on campus is actually a distraction. You can hold up signs and have rallies on campus, but the Congress gets $3.1 billion a year for Israel. Everything APAC does is focused on enforcing Congress. Congress is where you have leverage, so you, you can't influence the President of the United States directly, but the Congress can. APAC is very interested in making sure that every representative and every senator toes the line on Israel. And uh, it is highly effective in that regard. That's why it's considered to be synonymous in many people's heads with the lobby. APAC's website shows members of Congress attending its conferences and declaring their support for Israel. And on behalf of Congress, thank you for sending a clear and unequivocal message to the world that the United States stands with Israel now, tomorrow, and always. I reject the BDS movement, whether it be on campuses in France and London or right here in the United States of America. To get elected in the American political system, you need lots of money. What APAC does is it makes sure that money is funneled your way if you're seen as pro-Israel, and it'll go to significant lengths to make sure that you stay in office if you continue to be uh, staunchly pro-Israel. May God bless Israel. May God bless the United States of America. May God bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. They have questionnaires. Anybody running for Congress is expected to fill out a questionnaire. And they evaluate the depth of your commitment to Israel on the basis of that questionnaire. And then you have an interview with local people. If you get APAC support, then more often than not, you're going to win. Jim Moran is a Democrat who represented a congressional district in Northern Virginia. You realize it's not just the money, it's the number of concerned activists. They'll send out postcards, they'll make phone calls, they'll organize. I mean, I mean, that's the democratic process. They understand the democratic process. We made sure that there were people in every single congressional district. And then you'd call them up and say, I'm calling from APAC in Washington. I did these calls. We hear that you're good friends with Congressman so-and-so. Oh, my God, yes. We've been friends since elementary school. Well, what does he think about Israel? I never talked to him about Israel. Well, can I come down and talk to you and help you figure out a way to talk to him about Israel? No, just tell me. What should I say? I don't have to. I'll just tell him. Our undercover reporter wanted to learn more about how funding is secured for congressmen. Speaking of the devil. David Oakes, a prominent pro-Israel advocate, invited Tony to a fundraising event. Oakes later called him to discuss the details. Is it just a social event? No, hold on. I'm going to email you a list of the people that this group supports. This is 
is the biggest ad hoc political group, and I'm definitely the wealthiest in D.C. Hold on. Mark Kirk, senator from Illinois. Ted Deutsch from Florida. Barbara Comstock, she's the congressman from Virginia. Richard Byrd from Carolina. Kelly Ayotte, she's fantastic. She's in the Arms Committee. They'll walk in the room and they'll say everything here is off the record. And then they'll say, here's a little bit about me, and then people will ask very specific questions. The fundraiser was being held in a wealthy suburb of Washington. A big tech room. It makes a difference. It really, really does. It's the best bang for your buck. And the networking is phenomenal. Congressmen and senators don't do anything unless you pressure them. They kick the can down the road unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. Right now, our current contribution limit from any person to a candidate is $2,700. Now, that's a lot of money, you know, and, and that can certainly buy us some gratitude with the lawmaker. But if you really want to add punch to uh, that type of buying of favors, what you do is you get 50 or 100 people together at an event like this, all chipping in $2,700, and then you bundle it all together and hand over the total amount to the lawmaker. At that point, we're talking anywhere up to a quarter million dollars. So suddenly you've got a group of people with the same demand they want from the lawmaker handing over a quarter million dollars. That buys a lawmaker. The fundraiser was for Anthony Brown, who ran for Congress in November 2016. This is direct spending. Brown's going to use that 30 grand to do ad campaigns. So they strategically pick the ones who are in the close reach that they want to build relationships with. Uh huh. So we want the Jewish community to go face to face in a small environment, 50, 30, 40 people, and say, This is what's important to us. We wanted to make sure if we give you money that you're going to enforce the Iran deal. That way, when they need something from him or her, like the Iran deal, they can quickly mobilize and say, look, we'll give you 30 grand. They actually impact it. He's actually saying, we're buying this, these office holders. And that's the point. We're chipping in all this money so we can hand over 100000 or 200000 to the office holders so we can buy them. They're not supposed to advertise. There's yeah. only the advertising law. I would be surprised they had an invite. I've never seen an actual invite before. Oakes described a similar event he attended in New York, which included donors from Wall Street. In New York, with Jeff Talbot, we don't ask a goddamn thing about the Palestinians. You know why? Because it's a tiny issue, that's why. It's a small and significant issue. The big issue is Iran. We want everything focused on Iran. What happens is Jeff meets with the congressman in the back room, tells them exactly what his goals are. And by the way, Jeff Calpins is worth two hundred fifty million dollars. Basically, they hand him an envelope with twenty credit cards and say, "You can swipe each of these credit cards for a thousand dollars each." There is a disclosure law that is designed to highlight whether there may be potential money laundering going on in events like this. And that is if the funds are earmarked. Uh, and that means the organization has to disclose who showed up at that event and how much each individual chipped in and what they handed over to the lawmaker. What's the name of the group that puts this on? It doesn't have a name. There's no name. It's an ad hoc political group. For all the like, legal reasons, people pool their money. What this specific group is doing to try to avoid that disclosure requirement, it isn't taking money and then putting it in its own account and then handing it over to the office holder. It's just collecting credit card information and then turning that over directly to the candidate. Therefore, it's not violating the earmarking law and they're not reporting this. And so each individual is subject to that $2,700 limit. And if any individual goes over that limit, they are violating the contribution limit. They cannot legally do that by laundering money through other individuals. If you 
give five thousand, you can definitely ensure that we don't that I don't go over the twenty six hundred. You know what I'm saying? A relatively small number of families supply hundreds of millions of dollars annually to lobby politicians. One of the most effective uses of the lobby's funds occurs when Congress is on its break. Every year, they fly hundreds of members of Congress to Israel uh, for these extended travel junkets that are, that are really lavish. They're first-rate vacations. They'll rack up $20,000 or more for a vacation for a member of Congress the member can bring along their spouse, and they have a great time. An attempt was made to change the law so that all expenses paid trips would be considered a bribe. I drafted legislation to try to reform the whole profession of lobbying to get rid of free travel and gifts from lobbyists. The Honest Leadership and Open Government Act of 2007 significantly enhance the travel restrictions that if you're an organization that employs a lobbyist, you can only provide a one-day trip for a member of Congress. Then APAC exerted its influence. There was a major loophole written into the travel restriction that was essentially engineered by APAC, and this loophole is widely known as the APAC loophole. The clause excluded educational trips organized by a charity that didn't hire lobbyists. APAC happened to be affiliated to such a charity. It doesn't have an office, it doesn't have any employees, it's just a tax form that they filed. Gifts of dinner, gifts of wonderful resorts to stay at, gifts of entertainment, all of which is packed up into one of these trips is a very, very effective tool at influence peddling. The money raised by APAC doesn't just fund congressmen who support their goals. If you wander off the reservation and you become critical of Israel, you not only will not get money, APAC will go to great lengths to find somebody to run against you and uh, support that person very generously. And the end result is you're likely to lose your seat in Congress. They threaten. They immediately threaten, even if they know that APAC can't defeat them, APAC can make their lives more difficult. They can make sure that their next town meeting or something, uh, some members of the Jewish congregation jump up and say, but you're anti-Israel. In 2002, APAC was lobbying Moran to vote for the invasion of Iraq. The executive director of uh, APAC said that his most important accomplishment was securing the authorization for the use of U.S. military force in Iraq. APAC was pushing it very hard. Why does APAC benefit from the United States going to war? The United States getting involved in wars in the Middle East is ultimately in Israel's interest, because we have a stake in the region. Congressman Moran refused to vote for the invasion, as APAC Mr. requested. Speaker, there are compelling fundamental reasons why this body should oppose this resolution. Then at a public meeting, he was asked a question. A Jewish woman actually stood up in the town hall. She said, uh, why aren't more Jews involved in the marches against the war? I said, if the leaders of the Jewish community were opposed to the war, I think that would make a difference. The lobby reacted claiming this was evidence of Moran's belief in a Jewish conspiracy that was leading America to war. There was a conservative rabbi in my district who was assigned to me, I assume, by APAC. And he had warned me that if I voiced my views about the Israeli lobby, that my career would be over and implied that it would be done through the Post. And sure enough, the, the Washington Post editorialized brutally. Everybody ganged up. So what are the main outlets that TIP work with? Washington Post is the biggest one. Okay. Isn't that like just down there or something? Yeah, it's actually that building. Moran claims the Washington Post's editorial board has a close relationship with APAC. The principal editorial board of the Post itself has been a very effective instrument. Because they've been able to maintain their credibility, and, and it's a great paper in every other way, 
but because they have such credibility, they're extremely effective. Everyone knew he wasn't anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism has come to mean anti-Israel. The APAC crowd doesn't really care very much about whether or not a person likes Jews or wants one to move next door. All they care about is what their position is on Israel. Both of my daughters married Jewish men, and grandchildren are Jewish. Anybody that considers me anti-Semite is ignorant. And there's no more special interest that has any more influence than the pro-Israel lobby. Well, every candidate for Congress at that time had a pledge. They were given a pledge to, to sign. And I was uh, new on the scene. And uh, so the pledge had Jerusalem as the capital city, uh, the military superiority of Israel. American Congress people have to sign this pledge. Yes, you sign the pledge. If you don't sign the pledge, you don't get money. So, for example, it was almost like uh, water torture for me. My parents observed this. I would get a call, and uh, the person on the other end of the phone would say, I want to do a fundraiser for you. And then we would get into the planning. I would get really excited because, of course, you have to have money in order to run a campaign. And then two weeks, three weeks into the planning, they would say, did you sign the pledge? And then I would say, no, I didn't sign the pledge. And then my fundraiser would go kaput. So well, I just want to get into this pledge a little bit more. Um, so this is uh, basically something that is mandatory, that every congressperson has to sign, saying that, what, Jerusalem, you said, is the capital of Israel, and what else? Uh, uh, you make a commitment that you will vote to support the military superiority of Israel, that um, uh, the economic assistance that Israel wants, that you would uh, vote to provide that. This isn't a question for the Congress people serving that they are representing or they're supposed to be representing the people of the United States, not a foreign country, and yet they have to pledge allegiance Yes. to a foreign state. That's what no I one was, questions this. That's what I was asked to do. And um, I made it public. This Probably nobody had said anything about it. But I made it public, and then, you know, the excuse was, well, you know, those were just overzealous uh, ag advocates for Israel. So then the tactic changed. And, uh, but this is what is done for 535 members of the United States Congress. 100 senators, 435 members of the House of Representatives have to now write a paragraph, which basically says the same thing. So it's not a pledge, but it's a paragraph, and you post it, and you know, there are these forums you have to go to at the synagogues or whatever, and then, you know, if you don't perform appropriately, then you don't get money to run your campaign. The problem is that it requires an awful lot of money to run a campaign. I am convinced that it constitutes a danger for all America and threatens to rip the fabric of our a democracy. Says the emergence of a network of pro-Israel PACs as an important source of campaign funds for federal candidates has become an issue of intense controversy even among American Jews who want to promote Israel's security but don't want to be perceived as being driven by a single issue. I didn't say that, that's what this book says. There was little doubt that con contribution decisions are centralized either through a formal or informal arrangement, and then it proceeds to list these pro-Israel PACs. It says it is well documented that many of the pro-Israel PACs were created with a PACs encouragement. One would think that given the terrible brutality that 
is visited every day of the year against the poor Palestinians in the occupied territory, that the American congressmen, the American senators would be lined up 50 deep every day in their chambers to speak with outrage and anguish about what was going on in the occupied territory. But you can search the congressional record which prints every word that is said in both chambers of the Congress and not find one word of criticism of Israel for its behavior. In a nutshell, it is because the American congressmen are afraid of the power of Israel's lobby. They are convinced that if they challenge the lobby, they will pay a price next election day, and politics is survival. They all want to be reelected. See how your candidates score on the Israel Palestine issue and find out how much money they've been given by the pro Israel lobby. Check out the congressional scoreboards at IsraelPalestineNews.org by clicking the link in the description below.